Welcome to the podcast from Eden Worship Center. Because we believe that it is God's Word that does God's work in God's people, we want you to hear the gospel preached in the gathering of believers. We want you to read it for yourself and to join us as we think together and talk together about the sermon from this past week and what's going on in our world. You can join the conversation by sending in your comments and questions to EdenWC at Hotmail.com. May God cause His Word to come alive in your heart today. All right, well, welcome to the Midweek Podcast. Pastor Matt here. And Pastor John. All right, well, uh, this week we're going to be looking back at the passage from Genesis chapter 4. We had uh, the second half of the story of Cain, uh, the son of Adam and Eve, and then into his line a little bit, and then... I think this passage is contrasting his line and then the line through Adam's son, Seth, yes. uh, through which we're going to get all the patriarchs. Yep. Uh, we're going to yep. get Noah. We're going to get Abraham. We're going to get Moses. Mm-hmm. And just contrasting uh, this world where you have those who have faith and those who don't. Yes. So, yeah. Yep. Excited to think back through that. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. I uh, In putting the sermon together, in fact, I, I said something to Pastor John that uh, this was an odd week for a sermon prep for me because there were so many things that I'm like, yep, we got to talk about that in the midweek podcast. And then I mentioned <laughs> like 45 of them on Sunday yes. and the whole sermon just sounded like a commercial for our midweek podcast. <laughs> well, I think it should bump our numbers up a lot. We should have at least four people. Yeah. This yeah we're going to be right? like maybe double digits. It yes. could go wild. Our tens and tens of listeners. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. We joke about that. Uh, we are actually super grateful for, uh, the people who do not only listen, but who think through God's word together with us. And yes. I, I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this, that we would yeah. uh, not just have a podcast for a podcast sake. Uh, cause I think everybody's busy enough that mm-hmm. nobody needs one more thing just added to their plate so they can feel like they're doing it. <laughs> right. Uh, but if we can engage with God's word one more time, that yes. Just even just one more time thinking through, uh, it helps us hide that word in our heart. Absolutely. And it, it's not just somebody else's comments about it. Uh, as you're listening to the podcast, or I guess for the two of you who watch it, uh, <laughs> because you're, I mean, do you take your glasses off? I mean, because we're not winning any beauty <laughs> contests here, let's be honest. But um, for those of you listening to it, like right now, you're engaging with God's mm-hmm. word. You're part of this process of hiding God's word in your heart. And yes. just want to commend you for that and yeah. keep asking good questions. I think one of the great things about it is, you know, when, when you're up there preaching, it's, it's not the most opportune time for somebody to raise their hand and ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, but this gives a great opportunity for those who are thinking through what is being said to go, well, what about this? And this is that great opportunity for those who really want to dig into the word to have some of those questions answered that they have. Yeah. Super good. Super good. So there's some interesting, uh, stuff in this passage. Uh, one of them that led up to this passage. So it's not, it, it, we specifically looked at Genesis four, starting with verse 17 and then on a little bit into chapter five. Uh, so one of them that isn't covered in here, but the, the thought process that leads into it was the fact that there's a chance that Adam, the first man, and his son Cain, the first son born to man, Mm -hmm. could have potentially only been about a year apart in age. Oh, yeah. Yes. Which is, it's kind of mind blowing because that, (laughs) that just does, like this only worked one time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It has to be at creation. When I was a kid, uh, my dad would always, like his standard go-to dad joke was the, like, how are you going to be able to spot Adam and Eve when you go to heaven? and know it's them. And the answer was because they're the only two without belly buttons. Oh, yes. Yeah. Everybody else was born. <laughs> Everybody yep. else came through this birth process. They were created and they weren't necessarily created as babies. In fact, that doesn't fit the biblical narrative no, at all. Not at all. Would have been created, even though he's like one minute old with the appearance of age. Mm-hmm. And here's what really struck me about that. Uh, And to be honest, I don't remember who I was reading or listening to. Uh, I guarantee this is not an original thought with me. So if somebody's like that, Matt, he's a (laughs) deep thinker. Uh, Well, I hope so, but maybe not an original (laughs) thinker. Uh, They were looking at some of the 
the questions, and I, and I think guys like Ken Ham do a great job of answering objections to a, a scientific, but specifically God-hating mm. community yes. who says uh, what you find in God's Word doesn't match the archaeological record, doesn't match the geological record, mm. and you know the earth is X amount of years old, and it doesn't fit with the story that we have in the Bible, right? the truth that we have yes. in the Bible. And uh, I don't remember who it was, but they, they said Adam's created with the appearance of age. Mm -hmm. There's at least a possibility. It has to be one of the possibilities that God right. created a world that didn't look like it was brand new. Yeah. Like mountains that looked like mountains. Right, right. Uh, I, I like the way Answers in Genesis puts it. Uh, it God created them with maturity. Uh, that Adam was created completely mature. Um, he didn't just have uh, the outward physical appearance of age, but uh, you know, if if I'd have had a son when I was twelve years old, I I would not have been able to <laughs> mentally or emotionally uh, that, that would have been a that. disaster, <laughs> a disaster. Uh, so even further than just the the appearance of age he was he was created emotionally and mentally yeah. mature and capable of handling what came uh with a son did maybe. you say what came or what came <laughs> but um <laughs> yep sorry uh so yeah the when geologists will say oh it takes millions of years for mountains to form or for valleys to form um god created those instantaneously the earth already had that that appearance of age or that that maturity uh yeah it, it really is something that it seems like you read it and go oh well yeah of course yeah but like you said a god-hating society uh is going to nitpick wherever they can yeah and it and their only design i i always think of this when when i think of the phrase nitpick because we we use it to go you're just being picky, you know, uh, unduly picky. Mm -hmm. Only, you know, nits is another word for lice. And <laughs> if you have lice and someone is methodically picking through your hair, you're very grateful for it. Like I'd be grateful for hair. I'd be grateful for <laughs> hair. <laughs> now, here's, here's an interesting psychological insight into uh, us weird bald people. <laughs> Uh, you know that thing that happens when you get around people and someone starts talking about lice and people with hair like start itching their heads like <laughs> yes. like that psychological like, oh, no, my head itches just thinking about it. Uh -huh. I found myself people talking about it and like you start scratching your head and you're like, wait, I don't even have hair. There's nowhere for the lice to go. And my head still itches. I'm a crazy person. Uh -huh. I, but there is it, when it comes to something like that and with truth and it i think this also goes to scientific truth mm -hmm. we want that kind of carefulness we want mm -hmm. methodical that that's the whole idea of a scientific method oh, yeah. we want them to dig down uh in minute detail to get to the truth mm -hmm. the problem is and it's exactly what you said it it's a god hating nitpicking mm -hmm. where they're not just looking for truth or error right they're actually intentionally starting with the premise, I'm going to disprove the God of the Bible. Yes. Right? I'm going to prove I'm right and God and his word are wrong. Yes. And it, that is where I, I think we start to see a bit more of the truth of what they're after, what mm -hmm. their design is, as mm -hmm. opposed to the origins of the scientific method, which is there is a God who is knowable, who has made the world in a way that is knowable. Therefore, we can know it. Yes. If you yes. just follow the, the theories of chaos and evolution, there's really nothing in that that says there's any discernible pattern that we should be able to know because it's all just random chance. Yeah. Yeah, it's only if you start with an orderly God of creation yep. that science makes any sense. Yes. So yes. super terrible thing when we say, well, I either believe in God or science. Oh, if you don't yes. believe in God, I don't think you can believe in science. That, <laughs> that's one of my pet peeves. That's the bottom of that argument. Yep. Yep. And uh, Henry Morris from Institute of Creation Research gave a great um, illustration one time of why um, scientists get things so wrong. 
And he said, you know, if, if you walked into a room and I was sitting there and I was peeling potatoes and you observed me peeling 10 potatoes and you looked in my bucket, and noticed that there were, there were already 20 potatoes in the bucket. And I added another 10 and it took me about two minutes to peel each potato. You would figure, okay, so 20 minutes to peel 10 potatoes. There's now 30 potatoes in the bucket. That means I've been sitting there for an hour peeling potatoes. Very reasonable sure. observation, very reasonable conclusion. What you didn't know is that when I came into the room myself, there were already 20 potatoes in the bucket. I had only been peeling potatoes for 20 minutes, yeah. not, not 60. And when scientists say things like with the age of the earth, it must be this age because of things like carbon dating and all that kind of stuff, they are discounting the fact that there are things that affect uh, the earth. There are things that affect carbon-14, uh, and there were already 20 potatoes in the bucket with the age of the earth. Yeah. God created it mature. There were already 20 potatoes in there, but because they discount that, they're going to count all 30 potatoes yeah. instead of the 10 that have actually been ongoing. Uh, I thought that was just great a, illustration. Yeah. Uh, again, that was Henry Morris from uh, Institute for creation research. So, so basically I steal somebody's idea and say, I can't remember where it came from. And then you say who he is and who he works for <laughs> real nice, real nice. Plagiarism is the highest form of compliment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So it, it's interesting thinking about that uh, and looking at this passage in particular, uh, the lack of evolution that the Bible presents us. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of Christians who are working overtime to try and say uh, the Bible and evolution can overlap, can share the same space. Mm -hmm. And here we have Adam and Eve have a son. His name is Cain. So by, by the second generation... Mm -hmm. He builds a city and names a city after his son, the third generation. Yeah. So this isn't millions of years of evolution and mm -hmm. then uh, cavemen and then slightly better than caveman. And right. Do you remember when Saturday Night Live had, had the caveman on back in the 80s and 90s? <laughs> yes. Just delightful. Yes. Like, what if a caveman <laughs> stumbled into caveman the lawyer? I don't understand these things. I'm just a caveman. Uh, so it doesn't, that didn't fit on Saturday Night Live. And it doesn't fit in the biblical narrative because by yes. generation three, they're building cities. Yeah. Not living in canes and clubbing their wife over the head to <laughs> drag, drag her into the, the cane. Yeah. To, to, yes. To get a wife. Like this is, this is God ordained organization that mm -hmm. it, it's exactly if we don't start with God built maturity into the first people, mm -hmm. it makes no sense that they've already figured out cities by the second generation. Yeah, yeah. And what, uh, metallurgy and uh, really important livestock and agriculture, not wandering nomadic tribes, but agriculture by what, the third, fourth generations. Yeah, that certainly doesn't fit yeah. evolution. Yeah. So that it, the Bible is not, oh, I want to say this really carefully because there are, there are, Bible believing Christians who end up holding really different views. We talked about this at mm -hmm. the beginning of Genesis mm -hmm. on, on the age of the earth and, and what that creation looked like. Right. Uh, but a straightforward reading, that's how I should say it. A straightforward yes. reading of God's word would not lend one towards evolution, but that God created these people with certain, certain inherent things within them, yes. certain maturity within them, yep. which is why we see, the city. Uh, and sadly, by the time we see the city, uh, the other thing that we're seeing inherent within this fallen mankind is sin and selfishness and mm -hmm. rebellion against God. Yes. Which we continue to see today. Yeah. Uh, one of the difference is uh, these people back in uh, these first couple chapters of Genesis, uh, up until they come out of the ark, are living a ridiculously long time. Yes. <laughs> Ridiculously long time. Uh, it, it's kind of mind boggling when you start thinking about a, a human being who would live 900 years. Oh, I know. 
And then, then the Bible isn't going to give us any details of uh, how that worked or what that looked like. Right. So uh, if you live 900 years, did you still retire at 65? <laughs> It actually does give us that one. I think one you're cause... probably just getting out of diapers at 65. <laughs> well, yeah. I, well, yeah. <laughs> did we expect potty training to be done by the mid thirties or how exactly did that work? You know, yeah. <laughs> it, we know that it wasn't like early retirement because Noah doesn't start building the ark till he's about 500 years old. Yeah. And he's going to work on it for a hundred years. Uh, and then as mm -hmm. Genesis is going to talk about it. It's going to say in the 600th year. Well, it's not talking about the 600th year of the earth. It's talking about the 600th year of Noah. Mm -hmm. And so clearly these guys are working. They're productive. They're thoughtful. Mm -hmm. They're leading their families. They're, they're influential in their community for hundreds of years. Yes. So how can that be? How can it be? that that is true and not just some mythological thing. Cause a lot of re religions have uh, some mythology, some origin story that, yep. you know, when you look at it in modern sensibility, we just sort of shake our head and go, well, we know that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can't remember if it's a Babylonian or Sumerian legend of three different Kings, father, son, and grandson who between the three of them reigned for 37,000 years or 27,000. <laughs> yeah. That's several thousand years. Yes. Uh, but then how is that different from this? Yeah. Uh, I think one thing we look at is the effect of sin. Uh, back in the days when, uh, mimeographs and Xerox were pretty brand new. If you made a copy and then you took that copy and made a copy of it, and then took that copy and made a copy of it and just made a copy of each succeeding copy, pretty soon you're going to have a very messy copy. Yeah. Uh, because each succeeding copy um, picks up all the flaws of the preceding and then adds its own flaws. And we can see the same thing with uh, the effect of sin on our bodies that Adam and Eve were created absolutely perfect. Um, and to live forever and to live forever. Uh, so there, there weren't any of those mutations or anything in their DNA, but with the effect of sin, with each succeeding generation, you get that much further away from perfection. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, when you, the closer you get to perfection, the less breakdown of the bodies, the less sickness, the less decay, uh, it, I mean, it's actually just kind of common sense. Oh yeah, of course they would live longer. Yeah. Uh, of course this makes sense. Of course it makes sense. And then you take the flood and after the, during this time you had perhaps by this time millions of people and actually a pretty broad gene pool by this time. But after the flood, when we start to see age drop, well, according to Genesis 10, Noah didn't have any more kids. So everybody then came from Ham, Shem and Japheth. So out of them and their wives, you got six people. Three of them all have the same gene pool. Yeah. So we started from a very limited gene pool after the flood, which compounded that degen de degenerative effect Thank that you. we see yes. in people. So, yeah, it, it really is pretty, pretty logical and makes sense. It does, it, especially if God's intention from the beginning was not in heaven, but on earth, mankind would live forever. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's into that that he says, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. So the idea was not only would Adam and Eve live forever, but their offspring would live forever. Mm -hmm. Our bodies were actually engineered for ridiculous perpetual <laughs> motion. Oh, yeah. I mean, you think about uh, the human heart starts beating so early in the fetal development, mm -hmm. so young that you have this little heartbeat that starts going. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's a gigantic problem for the whole abortion movement. Yes. It's not a pro-choice movement. It's an abortion movement. Abortion movement, yes. Uh, the, the problem that they have is that little heart starts beating so early 
that if you start mm-hmm. and, and anytime we look at somebody, are they alive? I don't know. Let's check their pulse. Let's see if they have a heartbeat. Yeah. So immediately the first test is heartbeat. heartbeat. Oh shoot. This thing's alive. <laughs> if you go by that, well now you're, you're down to the time where it's about the time that a woman finds out she's pregnant. Yeah. About six weeks or so. And yeah. so early that it's early enough that she's not telling anybody. Yeah. You know, because it, worries about what could happen. Yep. And then you'd fast forward all the way to the end. That heartbeat is going to continue until the last second of life. And that's actually how, you know, somebody has died. <laughs> yeah. And we have no power over that at all. It is God built perpetual motion mm-hmm. of this little muscles, just bump, 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 bump. You know, we're asleep <laughs> and this muscle like bump, 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 bump. If yep. you, I wish our biceps did this, you know, <laughs> like you go to sleep I did, I did it last night. I was, uh, I mean, you got, you got some kind of heavy stuff that our church has been walking through in the last couple of days and, um, praying for Jody and Avery and their family. And, mm-hmm. um, I just woke up in a tangled ball <laughs> in the middle <laughs> of the night, you know, like had my arm wrapped around whatever. And it, what woke me up was crazy pain in my arm. <laughs> and I'm like, what? have I done? But you know, imagine if you went to sleep and you woke up, you're like, Oh, I'm so sore. And then you look down you're like, and I'm so ripped ripped. like all night long. My muscles were like firing. I added another inch last night. This is fantastic. (laughs) Uh, And God has engineered that into our our bodies, our organs, our hearts Mm -hmm. where they just keep running and running and running. And in fact, it's usually other systems that give out. Right. And then your heart stops. Mm Mm-hmm. And what did it look like for Adam and Eve yeah. to have been engineered to live forever? Mm-hmm. I mean, we live in, in such a fallen world that our expectation is things are going to fall apart and they're going to fall apart pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Whether it's our bodies or our cars or even our houses mm-hmm. or our country, uh, <laughs> that, that things are only, they have a really limited lifespan and then they're really going to fall apart. And by the end we go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's not how Adam and Eve were made. Right. And so you, you have this perfection to live forever and then sin comes in and you know, poor Adam barely, barely makes it to 930 years. Yeah. You know, poor guy. Didn't even make it to a thousand. Yeah. What a schmuck. <sighs> You should have worked out more. (laughs) That's what it was. A lack of lack of working out. And for a few generations, you're going to see people living eight, 900 years. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until the flood comes. And as they get off the ark, God says, this isn't good. I'm Mm -hmm. going to limit the lifespan of man to 120 years. Mm -hmm. And then what do we see? People living for 200 years. After mm-hmm. God says, I'm going to limit their lifespan to 120 years. Well, it's not because God forgot to check the expiration <laughs> date on people. Uh, it's actually this residual effect of uh, a lack of contamination, as it were, right. either in the gene, gene pool or in the way that their bodies were engineered. And they're living for a couple hundred years. Well, now you look at the oldest person on earth and you can find somebody who's 114 Right. 115 sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, right in that 120 year ballpark. Yeah. If somebody lived to be 200 years old, we would freak out. Yes. And yet that's, you know, if you're coming off of people living 900 years, yeah, you know, 200 years, oh, it's a tragedy. He was a kid, you know, just getting started. <laughs> yep. Taken so young. <laughs> it's, it is a different perspective, and I, I think that's part of how we lo- have to look at it. This is a completely different perspective than the vantage point that we have today. Yes. Well, and, and apart from the very logical and scientific reasons about it with the, the way the bodies are made, um, it was what God ordained so that society could thrive. Because when, I, as a woodworker, I look at, some master craftsmen who have been doing it for 50 years yeah. and it's incredible. Well, man, think about, I think you, you even mentioned this, uh, Sunday. What about somebody who's been practicing their craft like woodworking for 800 years, right? The level they must be at. And so for a brand new world with brand new people to have a society that would begin a culture that would begin to flourish, you needed people who could, um, 
perfect their craft, right. who could build on their own personal experience and knowledge and continue to perfect their craft to pass down to the next. And quickly, it had to happen within their lifetime. Yes. And so we, we've talked about this a few times. This is the hole in the evolutionary argument that it's this slow change over time. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. It, so if John is evolving and Kara is evolving, but it's slow and over millions of years, all right, well, the two of you can't have offspring. Like yeah. if both of you haven't developed a reproductive system, <laughs> uh, if both of you haven't developed a respiratory system, mm -hmm. uh, so either you can't breathe or you can't breed. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not going any further. Yes. Right? It has to happen within your lifetime. And we actually see that mm -hmm. in God's design of yep. the first people that within their lifetime, uh, you don't have like, well, he spent 20 good years working on this and then he apprenticed somebody else and they kind of had to start from zero and catch up mm -hmm. uh, five, six, 700 years perfecting yeah. this. So by the time that they pass on, which we find in this passage, uh, things mm -hmm. like taking care of animals, uh, mm -hmm. how to, how to not just follow sheep around in a field, which is what we see Abel doing. We're right. told that he's a, he's a shepherd cares for sheep. Um, but that everybody who is following after uh, these sons, and I flipped to the wrong page. I'm looking at it, I'm like, it's not even in the Bible here anymore. <laughs> That's because I, I flipped over to the flood. Uh, that they are, it, that he is the father of those who would live in tents and have livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, so these first nomadic herdsmen. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is the father of everyone who would play a musical instrument and music itself. Mm -hmm. And... The other one is the father of those who would hammer and then sharpen metal tools and objects and weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys created it because they live so long. Yeah. It, yep. it is the hold that evolution doesn't have. And the Bible has it right there for us. Yes. It makes sense that these yep. guys would live so long that the earth, that civilization might be established. And to think of how intelligent they were, you know, evolution says, ancient man was very primitive, very uh, undeveloped. But I want to know today who would be smart enough with no nothing to build on, nothing to go, hey, this is what they did, to, to look at a rock and go, hey, if I put that rock in a really hot fire and melt it down, I can probably get something out of it to create iron. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, hey, if I take this bone and put some holes in it and blow into it, it'll make a really pretty sound. Yeah. I, these guys had nothing to build on. We think we're smarter today, but it's just we have more to build on. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're building on someone else's information that they mm -hmm. had and they passed down. And yet we still can't figure out how they built the pyramids. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. It, every time I think about this, it, and that's a couple thousand years later. That's a couple yeah. thousand years after this. Mm -hmm. And... They're already figuring out, okay, this is how we're going to set these gigantic, <laughs> you know, SUV size stones up on this thing. And there's no crane. If there yeah. was a crane, we can't build a crane today that would build a pyramid. Yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're it right. is, it is staggering what they did. I, I also thought, um, in preparing for this and I, I mean, there, there's no biblical evidence for this, mm. but the whole scientific argument that we only use 10% of our brain today. Oh. Well, well, what if that's part of the, the fall, the, you know, imperfect humanity that's been passed down? What if that was not true mm -hmm. of early man? Yeah. And it, every once in a while, you'll see and hear things where somebody's brain works in a phenomenal way that the rest of us don't. Yes. And instantly like that, they can, in their head, do everything any math equation you can come up with mm -hmm. that ridiculous numbers. And it, you know, if they put their talent to good use, they'll go to Vegas and count cards, <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, now we got rain man in my head. Yeah. yeah the, the rain man <laughs> effect, uh, the people who with musical things have perfect pitch mm -hmm. and they hear a note and they know exactly what it is. And it, it's like seeing something only it's in their hearing. Mm -hmm. What if they used all of their brain and it, in yeah. fact, we're the dummies compared to them. Like, <laughs> yes. like not just we don't live as long, we're just not near as smart. Yeah. What if those tables are completely turned yep. and evolution has it completely backwards? 
Yeah, I, I think that is absolutely the way it is. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I say it I say it is authoritatively. Well, I'm not as smart as them, but I'm smart enough to know that's the way it is. I'm smart enough <laughs> to figure out I'm a dummy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, thinking about these guys who created all of these things, uh, they are the sons of Lamech, who is mentioned here, mm-hmm. uh, one of Cain's descendants who is the first person to take two wives that we're told of yes. in the Bible. And uh, we talked on Sunday and quite a few times previously that uh, many of these stories, especially in the Old Testament, are descriptive. Yes. They're describing what went on mm-hmm. rather than being prescriptive. Like you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription, mm-hmm. do this. Take mm-hmm. this, live like this. So it's not saying do this, it's just describing what they did. Yes. Right? So uh, we find Lamech, whose name has this um, connotation of being strong man, mm-hmm. who uh, takes two wives, uh, sort of bucking against God's system of one man and one woman it's the pattern that we see husband and wife uh, from the very first in Mm -hmm. the garden Uh, even cain himself takes a wife yeah really interesting doesn't say and he took a woman and she got pregnant uh, but that he takes a wife that this is why pairing husband and wife that god Mm -hmm. has created Uh, god did it on purpose by the way, we know that uh, <laughs> yes. Ephesians 5, it's intended to point us to Christ and his church. Yep. They'd never heard of Christ. They'd never heard of the church, mm-hmm. yet they were part of this picture that God was painting yeah. right from the beginning. Yeah. And yet what we find in Scripture is any time that we have a husband with more than one wife, mm-hmm. it's going to tell some story of heartache and yes. struggle and brokenness. Yeah, in that. yeah. You're absolutely right. Every time, even with Abraham and David. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. David being a man after God's own heart. And yet one of the things that we're given is the soap opera of David (laughs) and his wives. Yeah. And all of the pain and silliness that, you know, it's, it's suffering that we don't have to have. It's silly suffering. Yeah. When we have done this to ourselves, Mm -hmm. it's the, uh, (laughs) the old arrested development line. I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> like, I've done this to myself. Yes. Arrested development. What is that? <laughs> Said most of the people listening to this podcast. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I, I think it, it's just worth mentioning that two wives was not God's plan. It wasn't his intention. Right. Uh, it wasn't his best for humanity, even though my wife has suggested it on multiple occasions. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's kidding. Pretty sure. And if she's not (laughs) kidding, she's like, it would be great if we just had somebody to help with housework and care of the children when they were little. And uh, even if she wasn't kidding, which she was, uh, I can barely handle one wife. Yes. Please, dear Lord, there's no way I have a shot at two, you know. Nope. No. And I'm even a Mormon and I wouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) It had to be done. It had to be said. Uh huh. If you're talking about polygamy, I, I guess it, you got to make the obligatory Mormon joke. And in case we do have some new listeners who have no idea who I am, my last name is Mormon. So just want to make that clear. Pastor John Mormon. There you go. Uh, so I got a couple other things here. Any other thoughts that you think of that were in here? Things we need to talk about? Well, When it comes to the genius of ancient man, it's one of my pet topics. So I'm going to stop now or else I'll spend the next two hours talking about the genius of ancient man. (laughs) Good. Uh, So one of the things that that I referenced, and I I just wanted to mention it because I I think it's an important idea, is um, what St. Augustine had talked about in his... I, probably one of his most famous books is The City of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, pointing to the kingdom of God on the earth as it foreshadows the kingdom of God in heaven and earth for all eternity and you know what that looks like. But he contrasts that with the city of this world. Mm-hmm. So he's going to use the illustration of uh, Rome in his day and uh, 
and also Babylon in there, that those two get mm. kind of metaphorically used interchangeable right. for the city of this world that rejects God, that hates God, that wants to do it their own way, that wants their sin, and contrasting that with the city of God, the people of God. So Jerusalem, the heavenly city, the, the church of Christ himself, mm -hmm. and that these two are actually the only two cities that exist in the world. And he's not talking about literal cities. Right. Uh, so th this isn't like, let's build the Christian city, you know, movement. It's in the world, you're only, you're only going to see the family or the city of those who reject God and want their own way or who submit to God and want their own way. And mm -hmm. I thought it was a really interesting concept as I sort of read some of that and then thought through it, that both of those cities or families, as you look at it at the end of Genesis 4, the beginning of Genesis 5, mm -hmm. they're both marked by sin. They're, they're both marked by the same, even the physical things that we just talked about. No, yeah, uh, yeah. They're, they're on the same death timetable mm -hmm. as each other. That um, when you track through Seth's family, who's mm -hmm. going to lead to Noah, going to lead to Abraham, going to lead to Moses, you're going to see the same... Uh, I want to be careful how I say this, but the same wickedness that you see in the God hating world, right? Uh, at least the same propensity for wickedness. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these stories are just unbelievable where you'll, you read it and you're like, God's people did that. Right. And so I, right. I think on one level, we just shouldn't be surprised when we yeah. see things like that in the yeah. world. Uh, and yet, even though they're marked by, sin they're they're bent by their sin they're also marked by a desire to uh put off that sin and follow after god mm -hmm. which is what we see in david who you referenced earlier yeah, yeah. Uh, has these wives uh, his son is going to have many more wives than him solomon mm -hmm. and in fact we're going to be told about him that his wives led him astray that they stole yeah. his heart away from god yeah and yet the the marker of david uh, described as a man after god's own heart is that quick repentance mm -hmm. and throwing himself on the mercy of God. Yeah. Man, God, I don't want to do that. And now that's really different. Mm -hmm. So you see the world uh, marred down in their own sin. And yet the only turn that we see in them is I don't like the consequences of this. Right. Not God, I have sinned against you. We find that in David as he says, um, against you and you alone have I sinned. Mm -hmm. Well, he just murdered Uriah. Like yeah. he's writing that after statutory rape of Bathsheba mm -hmm. and the murder of her husband, Uriah. And then he looks at God and he says, God, my sin was against you and you alone. Yeah. And we look at it and go, uh, uh, well, not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except he saw through all of the earthly temporary consequences of that mm -hmm. sin implications of that sin, which is where I think a, uh, an ungodly repentance stops, which says, I don't like that. I got caught. I don't like the consequences. And yeah. therefore I'm going to try and be a better person. Right. That's not repentance. Right. David looks through that and he says, actually, God, my sin has been against you. I've offended you. I have misrepresented you. That's the big one. In fact, yes. com compared to the earthly consequences, it's you and you only have I sinned because yeah. you made them like they're yours. Yep. So in sinning against them, I sinned Sin against, against you. you. Yeah. And it, it just struck me as really interesting. Those two perspectives mm -hmm. and how often in the church and it repentance is, is the one I was kind of just mulling over a lot this past week. Uh, we look for worldly repentance in Christians. Mm. Yeah, but do you see the consequences of what you've done? Do you right. see do you see how it affected other people? Have you made a decision to be a better person? Mm -hmm. That's not repentance. That's no. self-help, yeah. which is why most Christian books in the bookstore are in the self-help section. Yep. And it's the consequence of that kind of uh, worldly repentance. Uh, Paul makes a very clear contrast between the, the godly sorrow and the worldly sorrow when yeah. he says that the godly sorrow leads to true repentance. And he doesn't say that the worldly sorrow just leads to uh, being mired in self-help. It says that it leads to death. Yeah, it, it, That is the final consequence when all you're worried about is consequences. Right. Uh, you get the ultimate consequence, uh, that eternal separation. Uh, and even with Christians who... 
uh, have put a genuine faith in, in Christ, but are still driven by, um, well, I don't like the consequence. Uh, they're still going to find a very shallow, mediocre walk with Christ. Right. Uh, because it, it, their sin and consequence is never about God. It's always about them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, that, that's why week after week, uh, it seems like we end every service with so entrust yourself into God's hands. Mm-hmm. Put your hope in Christ, not yourself, not your good works, not your own merit that you've earned from those good works, but Christ himself. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily get that by having an altar call at the end. Like I, right. I think it's good to have mile markers that say, yes, on this day I chose to follow Christ. Mm-hmm. And now, however many days later on a Thursday when everything's going wrong, <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, forget it. It's good to look back and go, no, I said this is where my hope is found. And though I'm struggling today, I'm not letting go of that. Yeah. But I think most of the time what we do is not self-help, but group therapy mm. where we have, we have people come down to the altar and they cry and their group therapy people get around them and they feel really good. Like, man, mm. we've, really, we've really done something here. And then they go home and think the same and talk the same and act the same yeah. and trust in themselves and not in God and his word. And we've, we've created generations of false converts yes. who believe that they're followers of Christ, who are obedient to Christ, when actually it, they've just done self-help and group therapy yeah. and there's been no conversion of their heart. That's the, that's the test of a Christian. Have they mm-hmm. gone from death to life? Yes. You were dead in your trespasses and sins Mm -hmm. until Christ made you alive. Right. Yeah. If your life hasn't changed, then you walked an aisle. Yeah. Uh, And that's it. Yep. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to still struggle with sin. Right. They they are. That's why Paul's going to tell us that we need to uh, constantly be putting to sin the flesh Mm -hmm. and the temptations of the flesh. Uh, Jesus is going to say daily, take up your cross and follow me. It's not a one and done type yeah, thing. Yeah. So we're not talking about those who struggle right. and will struggle every day from now until the time that they die. I sure hope not. Cause that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm out. Yeah, I'm out. We knew it. You Mormon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we're talking about those who uh, not only is there no struggle with their sin, there's all you hear is justification of their sin. Yes. Why their sin is fine. Yep. Why, you know, who are you to judge me? Mm hmm. You know, I think as soon as we start hearing, well, I don't know about you. As soon as I start hearing that, <laughs> I got giant red flags that go up that yes. say, this is either a bad reaction in the moment or a true revealing of the heart. Yeah. Either one I'm not super excited about. Yes. Yeah. When people say, well, I wouldn't have done that if they hadn't done this. Well, no, you're, you chose your actions. Yeah. It's, nobody can make you sin. But yeah, we're looking at, the woman who you gave me, Lord. Yep. Uh, I would never have killed Uriah if his wife hadn't been taking a bath on the roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why did I get those binoculars for Christmas? <laughs> it's yes. all your fault, Mom. I mean, you know, we're just yeah. we're blame shifting and looking for someone else rather than taking ownership of our sin and acknowledging that our sin is before a holy, righteous God. Mm-hmm. And it, we, we started talking about this contamination in humanity that causes us to live shorter lives, Mm -hmm. and yet one speck of contamination, not just DNA, not just genetic, not just physical things, but spiritual contamination disqualifies us from the presence of God, disqualifies us from eternity in the joyful presence of God. And Mm -hmm. I was going to say disqualifies us from eternity with God. That's not true. Mm -hmm. When we're told explicitly that it there is one passage that talks about those in hell being separated from God's presence. Mm-hmm. Yet we're also told it's the joyful presence because yeah. we're also told that it's Jesus himself who is uh, tormenting those in hell. Mm-hmm. That's a different, that, like come up with that coloring page for kids. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in Sunday school. Um, anyways, it, just this idea that, we have created so many false converts because mm-hmm. it's walk the aisle, say a prayer, 
And if you cry a few tears, if your emotions are moved at all, that's enough. Yeah. As opposed to those who say from now until the time I die, until this heart stops beating, I'm going to live, uh, to the best of my ability, by the grace of God, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, a life that honors God, that puts mm-hmm. my sin to death and says, Jesus is King. Yes. I think that's true Christianity. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, the book of first John makes a, it's a, it's a hard read, but he makes it very clear that one Christians will struggle with sin. Uh, but he also says that those who have this hope in Christ, it says that they, they will want to walk like Jesus. Yeah. They will want to be like Jesus. They will want to honor him. It says those who have this hope in Christ will will purify themselves just as Christ is pure, that they will take and do whatever is necessary to honor Christ because he is our all in all. Yeah. Uh, and he says those who don't, well, he says that they're children of the devil. He doesn't really pull any punches. <laughs> so no punches pulled into the book of First yeah. John. <laughs> well, one of the questions that we got this Sunday... I just want to pull it up so I get it here, Uh, was looking at the passage in Romans 5. So maybe we'll just wrap it up by looking at Romans 5 here that we read on Sunday. And the the passage that they were specifically pointing at was Romans 5.14 that says, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And their comment was, like, what on earth is this passage talking about? Like, what, what's being pointed at here? Uh, and <clears throat> a part of what's going on in Paul's argument to the church in Rome was maybe a little historical perspective. The mm-hmm. church has been really good at arguing over dumb stuff. <laughs> not, not big stuff, yeah, but dumb stuff. Uh, and sometimes inconsequential stuff, uh, like the one I even hate saying it out loud because it annoys me <laughs> so bad. Uh, one of the raging theological debates that was going on in Martin Luther's time, uh, when he's going to be talking about justification by faith alone, what it means to trust in Christ alone, in grace alone, through faith alone, unto salvation. And the big theological debate going on was, okay, so angels can be any size they want. So how many angels could fit on the head of a pin and could dance on the head of that pin? Yes. (laughs) It makes me angry just saying it. Like, I have heard that. I didn't realize that was from his... The contemporary argument during his day. Yeah, and I think that's what makes me so (laughs) mad is uh, theologians were wasting time on that when God is stirring up some tiny little German monk to go, (laughs) no, 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 let's trust in Christ alone, Mm -hmm. not your own merit or indulgences or, you know, idolatrous things like that. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Oh, it just bugs me. Uh, So anyways, that this answer, which is what we have in most of the New Testament, especially Paul's epistles to the church, he's answering questions or objections. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, objections that is in here is it's the law that reveals sin. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't know that we've sinned unless there is a a law, a command that we've broken. Mm -hmm. Well, Moses is the one who's going to write down the law. Right. Moses, who's writing the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Bible, who's writing this account in Genesis we're studying through. Um, he's the one who writes it down. What about everybody who lived before him? Mm-hmm. They clearly can't be held accountable because they didn't know. Right, right. Uh, so we went to Bible college in Scotland for a year. It was a one-year Bible college, and we came home. And in the, in the year that we were gone, they moved the stop sign that is in front of LaGrange hospital. And, uh, it's not even where it is now. They've moved it again since then. (laughs) Uh, evidently traffic studies weren't right. And, uh, I'm driving through there. We had, we had got home like two weeks before Mm -hmm. and I'm driving through LaGrange and I drove right through the stop sign in front of the hospital because it had never been there. Uh, and police officer pulled me over. In fact, I think it's the only time I've ever gotten pulled over. <laughs> and cause I drive notably slow, which my <laughs> wife points out a lot anyway. So 
uh, he's like, what are you doing? And I, I'm like, what stop sign? I have no idea. And he's like, there's a stop sign right back there. I'm like, there's never been a stop sign there in my entire life. He's like, it's been there for a year. At which point I said, I've been out of the country for a year hmm. and I, I just didn't see it. Therefore, and here was my argument. I didn't know. Hmm. I, I had no previous experience. So I'm justified in missing it. This wasn't sin or breaking the law. <laughs> I'm off the hook because I didn't know. That's the argument that's being made here. So everybody before Moses, before the law was given, is off the hook. They didn't actually sin because they didn't actually have the law mm. or the command of God. So Paul says, uh, you can say that and yet look at the fruit of what came out of it. If uh, mm -hmm. sin leads to death, what, what came out? What was the fruit that came out of their mm -hmm. lives? It was death. And so he says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So what was the mm -hmm. transgression of Adam? Adam had a direct command from yep. God. Don't eat that fruit. Yes. Don't, don't do it. And he listened to that direct command of God and said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. So they, it, from Adam to Moses, they may not have had the direct command of God. Now, we don't know what they had or didn't have. Right. We, we talked about that, the, the holes yep. in the narrative. Yep. Uh, and yet, even if their sin wasn't like Adam's, where they had a command and they said, nope, I'm doing whatever I want to, there was sin and rebellion in their heart that led to death. Therefore, sin and death reigned, reigned. even yes. from Adam to Moses. That, that's mm -hmm. why Moses gets thrown in there. Yeah. Instead uh, of saying from Adam to today, right. he was making the point in this period where there was no technical law. Yeah. Yeah. Which And we're going to be told uh, later on in the Old Testament and then confirmed in the New that God has written his law upon our hearts. Mm -hmm. That it, it's not just uh, a list of rules, do's and don'ts, commands that we either know and memorize or we don't. And like, oh, no, mm -hmm. I've totally missed it. Right. Like we know built into humanity, even fallen, sinful humanity, mm -hmm. that which is sin mm -hmm. and that which is not. Yeah. That's why Cain was worried that somebody would kill him. Because he recognized they're going to know I did something wrong and yeah. they're going to take vengeance on me for what I did wrong because he acknowledged they know I did something wrong. Right. Uh, so even second generation, they recognized murder was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting uh, just thinking about this. And mm -hmm. then one of the reasons that we read this together on Sunday was Paul's going to then make a really sharp turn and contrast that. So, since the, mm -hmm. the passage in Genesis was about contrasting two cities, two families, mm -hmm. uh, those who rejected God and those who walked after God. And Paul is going to make the argument that in Adam, that all sinned, all fell. Mm -hmm. He's the, the federal head over our inherited sin, that it's passed mm -hmm. on kind of like a, a sin infection. That yeah. We're just we're yes. just born with it. I, mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about earlier how Adam was sort of born with this appearance of age. Mm -hmm. Well, every baby is born with a fallen nature. That yeah. th there's this depravity that's inherent to man. Oh, yeah. In Genesis five, it says when Seth was born, it says that Adam had a son in his own likeness. Yeah, not in the likeness of God, but in his own likeness, in the likeness of man. Seth was born, which is good because yeah. when Adam is created, uh, God makes him in his likeness. Mm -hmm. Now we we still bear the image of God. Yes. But this, this is why the photocopy one is such a great example mm -hmm. because we are this photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Mm -hmm. Unless you yeah. remember the purple ones, yes. right? Shout out to the old people <laughs> listening to this. Uh, you really yes. don't get it. Cause what happens now is they just sort of get like lighter and less distinct. Yeah. But there was a day where if you made copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, at mm -hmm. some point you just have a big smear. Yes. Just a giant smudge on the page. Yep. And you can't see anything. You can't read anything. I remember those worksheets in grade school. Remember those? Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yet Paul's going to say that's not what Christ is like. Yeah. That now, Adam is a type of Christ. That's what mm -hmm. he's pointing at here, of the one who was to come. Mm -hmm. And yet... The free gift of righteousness is not going to be like the sin that inflicted 
mm-hmm. guilt upon the world yeah. that in Christ, we don't all have to then live up to this. We don't earn our own salvation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christ's body, Christ's blood has purchased for us yes. our forgiveness, has put on us the righteousness of God. Mm-hmm. Um, man, that's why week after week, we end the sermon, uh, the sermon time with communion. Mm-hmm. And we say, trust in Christ. Yes, it, It's his body broken in your place. It's his blood mm-hmm. shed in your place. And, you know, there, there really is a thing where that can become commonplace. Yeah. Oh, hey, here's what we do at, at the end of the service. Mm-hmm. It, and it can become commonplace, uh, whether it's at the end of the service or your church only does it once a year. Right. It, the commonplace is forgetting the costly sacrifice mm-hmm. in God sending his son. Yes. This was a precious, precious sacrifice, precious mm-hmm. gift that was given. And salvation is free and yet it is costly. It is costly. And I am so thankful. Uh, the end of this verse, when it says who was a Adam was a type of the one who was to come. So many people are like, well, it's unfair that we have to, suffer the consequences of Adam's sin. Um, when it says he was a type of one to, to come, like you said, he was the federal head. He he was representative of all mankind. But praise the Lord, it is the reason he was a type of the one who was to come is because so was Christ. Yeah. He, on the cross, was representative. Um, so we may not like it that Adam was representative of all mankind, but we sure love that Jesus was. Yeah. Uh, every rose has its thorns. Uh, Adam is a thorn, but if if we have a... And that's why we can have a greater appreciation of what Christ did for us. Because Adam is our head, the fall, sin, death, and Christ as our head, life. Yeah. It, yeah. Such Even a if thing. for a while, every cowboy sings a sad, <laughs> sad song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Oh, you were making such a beautiful point about Christ and redemption, and I couldn't get the song "Every Rose Has Its Thorn" out of yes. my head. Well, as, yeah. as soon as I said it, I'm like, "Oh, there's that song." In what my did head. I just say? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it's funny, but that that's actually a pretty decent way to wrap this up because I was struck looking at this passage in Genesis, how God reaches into a fallen, sinful, rebellious world and starts redeeming out of it these things that he's actually going to use to bless his people and tools that his people are going to use to worship him. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're going to sing Every Rose Has Its Thorn <laughs> on a Sunday together. Uh but as we look at the world around us, we need to make sure that we keep our eyes fixed on like Christ sees the world. Yes. You know, a world for which uh, he came. Now, I don't, I don't believe that he died for all the world because right. I, I believe his sacrifice was uh, sufficient and effective. Yes. So if he died to ransom someone, they're ransomed. They are ransomed. But he came and gave them the offer of salvation. Yes held out his hands to them mm-hmm. and they didn't want him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why later on in Romans eight, it says that whom he called, he justified whom he justified, he sanctified whom he sanctified, he glorified. It's all past tense. It's all a done deal. If he died to justify you, it's a done deal. Yeah. It will happen. Amen. Amen. Right on. All right. Well, Lord willing, we will see you this coming Lord's Day on Sunday. We'll worship together at 10 a.m. We have uh, Sunday school for all ages at 9. So it uh, be great to see you there. God bless you.